Hey everyone, this is Manly Badass Hero, and welcome back to the letter. Previously, we started Rebecca's route, which was essentially a story of passive aggressiveness. It begins normally enough. Isabella, I don't have time for this! Open up! Or as normal as shouting outside her room could get this early in the evening. On a Monday, no less. This isn't how I want to start my week, but here I am, trying not to make a fool of myself in front of anyone who happens to pass by. I'm not even sure if our landlady's home yet, and I sure hope not. She won't like this ruckus. But it's not like we haven't had an argument before. We have. Plenty of times. Just that one time with the groceries, and never that has something to do with the miss in her room. Sometimes it has to do with my eating habits, or her eating habits. There was also the one in the movie house a few days ago, but that one got resolved pretty uneventfully. Or so I'd like to believe. She seemed to be in a good mood when she asked us all out for that little celebratory treat. Anyway, the point is, we didn't go for five years worth of being friends without having a little argument here and there. A little ribbing of the sides, if you know what I mean. Granted, it can get pretty petty at times, but none of them has pushed either of us to end this friendship, smuggloop.jpg, yet. Although most of them do end up with her sulking in her room until I pull her out of it. A child through and through. This morning, however... You're still not going to believe me. Even if someone else already died, no? There really comes a point when you need to smack some sense into people. It's murder. The 40s said so. And yet, she's still going on about the Halloween prank like it's that bloody letter's fault. It's a piece of paper, Isabella! What can a piece of paper do? Give you a paper cut? Well, yes, I can do that. But you know what really can kill you? A ghost girl that can teleport anywhere and do anything. I swear, you can be so, so frustrating at times. But you know, hey, like, let's not think outside the box or outside the letter. Or outside the window when it's looking at you. I know Rose is a close friend to her, but she's doing her death a huge disservice by being like this. My friend died brutally, and I'm going to mope in my room for one day. Man, I'm such a whiny person. I should just go outside and act normal. Taking out the, my mobile, I dial her number and sure enough, her own rings on the other side of the door. I don't hang up in case something possesses her to answer, or she's just sleeping. I've been going at this for 15 minutes now. If she didn't hear me after that, she sure as hell is ignoring me. On purpose. Isabella, I know you're in there. Can you please stop this nonsense? You're acting worse than my students when they're throwing a tantrum. You're not a kid anymore. Oh boy, Rebecca's got a big surprise coming. A minute. And another. Then I'm ending the call while fishing out a copy of her key from my bag and unlocking the door. She landed years ago after I complained about the mess and offered my help in cleaning up. I thought the gesture was completely unnecessary. Then, after all, I could always knock. But she never did bother taking them from me. Always returning or turning away from the conversation whenever I insist. At one point, I've simply stopped trying to hand it back to her. Good thing I did. Now her stubbornness is coming in handy. For once, she did something right. Miracles of miracles, isn't it? Isabella, I'm coming in and we are going to talk! Without waiting for her answer, I pushed the door open and marched inside. Seems fairly normal enough. Her lights are off. Although the telly is running, it merely gives the room a dim glow. Dimmer than it used to be. In fact, mainly due to its age. She bought that set from a second-hand store nearby. It's been over since she started living here, though she doesn't really watch anything on it. Even on weekends, she doesn't seem to have any use for it. It's just for the background noise, so the place wouldn't be as quiet if she's working at home. She told me before how much she misses the clamor of the city. And here in Salemwell, it's just quiet everywhere. That silence offered more than anything new and unfamiliar she encountered in her first year here. If the rent isn't cheap, she probably would have moved away already. It's an odd side of hers, but there are worse ones. Like when she's moping. Or dead. I find her sitting at her work desk, bent over the mess of papers and folders littering the top, nose almost touching the papers she's working on. On one end I can make out the silhouette of a stack of empty noodle cups, though I fight the unexpected urge to wrinkle my nose at the sight. Her cleaning habits are also the least of my concerns right now. I can reprimand her later for it. 
But first, we talk and put an end to those silly misconceptions that have been feeding her mind. We need to talk about this letter nonsense! She doesn't answer. She doesn't move. She's giving me the silent treatment because I won't buy her little horror story. Just the thought of it irks me and prompts my already short temper. And with each second that passes, it grows even shorter. Isabella, I know you're busy. I'll let you go back to your work once we sort this out. You can't... you can't keep going on like this. Oh, I don't think she is. But not in the way you think. Still no response and slowly, frustration begins to seep into my tone. Why must you always be so difficult? Then, anger. Yeah, stop being dead weight, Isabella. I'm telling you to listen to me! Smug Luke dot JPEG. Oh, will you face me? I'm talking to you, Isabella! Without warning, I've given her an ample number of those. I'm marching across her room, each of my stride brisk and heavy with purpose when... It's not slipping on the apparent wet mess that forces my whole body to freeze. Rather, it's a sudden smell permeating the air. Bitter. Sharp. Thick enough that I can almost taste it. My hand hastily goes to cover my nose. But even then, the acrid smell still reeks. Like the smell of iron reacted to the skin when rubbed. Like blood. My gaze shifts to Isabella's back, head still bent over her table, unmoving. In this light, I can't get a good look at her. But I know for sure she won't simply leave a puddle here. Not when she's working on paper she could accidentally spill on. A puddle of what, though? I don't want to make any hasty judgments yet. Despite what my mind screams at me. It could be anything. It could be... It could be... There could be a leaks here somewhere, or whatever. Or maybe it's red jam, or tomato sauce. Or blood. But despite what I tell myself, fear easily worms its way to my voice when I call out to her again. Isabella? Something heavy lodges itself to my throat. B Bell? The sound of my heartbeat crashes against my ears. Bell? Answer me! Please! With a trembling hand, I reach for her shoulder, and gently as I can, I turn it around. <gasps> oh god, now it's up close. Holy cow. My heart stops. A chill runs down my spine. Every edge, every corner of the room suddenly goes sharp. I can't breathe. And before I know it, my horrified scream ripples through the air. <laughs> yeah, that's nice, tasty Chivo. Very tasteful. A few hours afterwards, the whole place dissolves into chaos. Nameless people in white suits moving in and out of the room. Fellow tenants crying in the nearby hall to get a glimpse of whatever's inside. Man, that ghost, that ghost, like, gives no breaks. Paramedics and police officers trying to corral a growing group downstairs. At some point, noisy journalists have started flocking in, likely for a scoop. Let me see how the branch tree looks like with this. Hmm. So that's a pretty big gap, and then it kind of fills out there. I'm assuming the bomb route's the coma route. Because it's a scoop no matter how much I want all of them to stay away. Do not look at her. Not like this. That isn't how you should see her. It's a commotion. But miss the ambulance's bright flashing lights. The murmurs of the curious bystanders barely in any of it registers. Hell, I can hardly remember anything when my landlady pulls me out of the room. I don't feel her hand against my shoulders as she ushers me out. I don't hear her mutter reassurances. Is it a gentle touch of comfort? How does her voice sound? They all come out empty, each and one of them falling hollow in my deafening ears. Because she's gone. She's gone. Yet, I can't even bring myself to shed a single tear. Much as I will myself, no matter how much I repeat the words in my head, none of it will come out. What's wrong with me? It's called shock. We're friends, aren't we? I should be crying. If not, I should be angry at whoever did this to her. Anything. Anything better than this cold, empty feeling at the bottom of my stomach. Anything better than standing around here like a useless numpty that I am. Numpty. Watching all these people sit by and examine her like she's just some off her victim. Female. Around 20 to 25 years old. Distant. Time of death must be less than five or six hours ago. Impersonal. Of course. Still unknown. Everything about her. Now broken down to ruthless statistics. She has a name, damn it. She has friends here. Not me. 
She has a family waiting for her back home. Someone. Someone, please. I feel like this would be awful news to hear back from her family. In all seriousness, like that. Especially the way of death. Scene. Second floor, sir. Just upstairs. Second room after the stairs. Ashton? Hold on a sec. Did you say second room after the stairs? Exactly what I said, sir. CSM should be there to brief you further on the scene. But, um, if I may, Inspector, you really don't want to see the body right now. Inspector Abigail had to excuse herself for a while after... after, you know. I'll be the judge of that. Thanks. His voice dripping from the stairs below falls like a splash of cold water on me. Somehow, at the familiar tone of it, the world has suddenly tilted sideways as right at itself. Every color, every sound rushes back in, and my head immediately snaps up in search of him. Another officer stops him upon reaching the floor, but a quick show of his badge is enough for them to allow him in. Even his police officer badge, uh, has his, like, fancy coat and everything in. Like, it's not professional looking or nothing, it's, here's my fancy vampire coat. He doesn't waste any time. And Ash quickly makes a beeline for the room and passes by where I'm standing without so much as a glance. I like just to imagine, like, the the coat thing is just laziness. And, like, the, he has, like, an actual like, normal cop outfit and it's a normal photo. And he has, like, maybe scrubs on or something right now. I like to think that. I know it's not true at the moment. He doesn't even have to notice me. His steps are even and sure as he walks by. His jaw clenched in a tight line, a complete departure from the easygoing air he gives off when he's with us. Like this, it's hard to think of that Ashton, the one in front of me, as the same person. But worried creases on his forehead, a stiffness on the lines of his shoulders. And I know, I know the moment that expression is on him that his news should not just come from some crime scene manager. I should say something. I need to say something. Call out to him. Stop him. Because more than anyone, you shouldn't be the one taking on this case. You may be someone who'll understand how I feel about this, who knew the kind of person Isabella was. But will he be able to go at this with the same passive indifference his associates have? Of course, I'd never doubt his capability. That's a given, and he's already proven that more than once. But this? This may not be easy for him. In all honesty, they would probably not put him on this case once they find out like that he's related to them. Um, well... Not literally related, but like, personal relationship. Try to tell him myself. Let's see where this bar is at. Under. It went up. Okay. I was the one who found her. The one who saw her first. Telling the rest of our group should at least be my responsibility. Lessen the blow for them as much as I can. Otherwise, they simply hear from the news. Delivered in the same uncaring manner. As if she have never been a huge part of our lives these past few years. I like to save them. Save him from that pain. Ashton, wait! Ashton stops dead in his tracks, turns his worried expression into solving into confusion. Rebecca? I thought they. Are you alright? Yeah, I'm good. But Ash, I. Ashton. In that room. In that room. The words refuse to form. My mouth opens and closes, yet even with my early resolve and a will to force them out. They still don't. All of them still lost in the haze of gory images and the acrid tang of blood. I shouldn't have assumed this would be easier. Shame fills me, especially with that tiny glimmer of hope he carries in his gaze, a searching look on him, as if he expected to hear some good news from me. A desperate prayer for his assumptions to be wrong. It pain means I couldn't bring him that, and I can only look away. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. His expression doesn't fade away like I surmised, however. It was an effort for him to keep his atmosphere light despite the shadow of death surrounding us. Slowly, he reaches up to me and gives me my shoulder a squeeze, light as it can be. A tiny effort to raise my spirits and perhaps even his own. Don't. This is no one's fault. Just stay here. Let me look at the situation. It couldn't have been her. Autopsy might reveal something different. Who knows? Oh, Ash. Ash, I was in there. I saw her with my own eyes and I'm sure it's... Becca, like I said, I'll look at the situation. Stay here, I'll be back. His tone leaves no room for argument. I see the moment he tucks it all away. His apprehension. The growing anxiety in his stomach. 
even the part of himself he showed us so openly before. The friendly, easy-going Ash. He hides it all, built an even thicker wall around it. He crosses the police table without looking back and walks into the room, an entirely different person. If I place it in the doorway, I witness all of it. How he never flinches nor gags at the smell of blood. How he studies and takes everything in with a straight face. How his voice drifts from the inside the room every time he asks a school question, and tone even and collected. How he checks the victims, Isabella's, lifeless body without batting an eye, going about his work as if nothing ha never happened at all. As if this isn't someone he knew personally. Doesn't this face you at all? Before long, Ashton goes back out of the hallway, still with the same impassive look on him. He waves someone over. Another officer. Forensics. Paramedic. After witnessing that, everything has become a daze for me. The next thing I know, someone's ripping a blanket over my shoulders. Make sure she's okay and calm enough before they start taking your statement. And then I don't protest when the medic starts leading me downstairs. She's speaking in hushed tones about an ambulance, though I don't understand much from it. But there's a thump. Muffled. Dull. Enough for me to miss it have I not looked back. And the sight that greets me upon doing so leaves a mark in my memory before descending the stairs. Ghost? No. There, Ashton stands with his back turned away from me, his shoulders shaking, a fist clenched firmly against the wall. And just like that, I have my answer. Does this phase him? No. He's worked plenty of cases before this one. He's got almost a decade of experience on that. Nothing's new in seeing and dealing with a dead body for him. But it hurts him. This hurts him more than anything. Things are less busy when the paramedic guides me downstairs. By this time, the entire flat complex has been sealed off from any outsiders, though a considerable number of people have already flocked from the building. Reporters, gossips, onlook onlookers. The size of them will probably grow until the important looking officers clear out from the area. Joy of joys. On the far side of the parking lot, a few officers interview some of the tenants, particularly the ones living closer to us. Some of them offered me pitting looks when I passed by, all of which I do my best to ignore. I don't need them. Even the sympathetic smile of Meg shoots my way, I return with less enthusiasm. She is, however, kind enough to escort me to get whatever I need. The investigators will be closing out the premises while the forensics gather evidence, she informs me. And of all the things that cross my mind first... M my mail. Instead of any basic necessities someone in their right mind would think of first. Ridiculous. Yet, she doesn't say anything. Simply nods and tells me to lead the way. For that, I'm grateful. Sometimes, the silence is enough. And sometimes, familiar sounds are enough. Even something as simple as a creak of an old mailbox once I pull its lid down. And the shuffling of paper against my fingers as I go through today's mail. Eels. Brochures. A letter for mom and dad. I should probably call them. Let them know. And <laughs> another one of Isabella's mail wound up in my mailbox. I should probably give this. My hand tenses. Fingers lightly tracing the name. Her name. Printed in bold letters at the top left area of the envelope. This will never reach her now. She'll never be able to read this now. A breathless chuckle. A ragged breath. A trembling hand over my mouth. Then for the first time tonight, tears well up from deep within. She's gone. October 25th. The following morning arrives unlike any other day before it. Glaringly bright and clear. Also, let me check the branching tree real quick. Are we already through this? No. Pretty long. Natural only. This is a very long route. The fact that it comes from with an extra helping of the unusual October weather doesn't help either. Although I appreciate catching a glimpse of an unclouded sky after the last week's bout of sickness, the sun is simply sunning a little too much today. Considering how the world has completely tilted on its axis last night. Too warm, too cheerful. A stark reminder of her. The kind of person she is. She was. That'll take some getting used to. Everything will take some getting used to. Maybe my would have helped me more if her name wasn't already on every imaginable local broadsheet and news program. 
if everything around me doesn't evoke a memory or two. But that isn't how this usually works, does it? Easing into these thoughts, I'm gonna go for a day without an entire person that always used to be there. Five years may be fleeting, but it's not for time for someone to grow on you. Not enough time for them to be a significant part of anyone's lives. It's not just mine, but Ashton's and Zachary's as well. Bloody hell. A fistfight almost broke out between those two just because of this... this whole thing. Never was at fault, of course. The emotions were high at the time. This was a Zachary meeting. They seemed to still be on speaking terms when I left, but... I wonder if those two are going to be okay. I suppose this is all part of the coping thing. A mess happens, we will have to pick up the pieces after. And not everything is going to be pleasant. It's always about making do of what you have. And if that means getting stuck staying at an inn while the pol police finish off their investigation, well, there's nothing I can do about that now. Luckily, the nearby cafe manager is also kind enough to offer me a space where I can nipperly put the sudden mess as my life in proper order. I've been sitting here for a few hours now. The manager gave me the table at the far end of the corner of the shop. For the most part, I was left alone. She might have something to do about that as well, which I am also thankful for. Were not for her. What's left for my morning and the rest of my afternoon might not have gone as uneventful as it did. By sunset, I've ordered down a few cups of coffee. Inform St. Goretti that I'll be taking leave of absence today to finish much of the task I've got scheduled today. So be productive when everything's taken into account. All that's left for me to deal with is the mail. Specifically, the letter addressed from Mom and Da, and the call I have to make because of it. I've been ignoring it the whole day, but not for one reason or another. Worried, afraid of what they'll hear my voice after last night. Of course, it's not like I'm used to being caught in situations like this or having to learn news while feeling under the weather. This isn't the first time, after all. Over the years, it's become some sort of tradition. Because their time in the academy actually brought with its connections. People from other fields, art, science, business, politics, you name it. Along with it are the occasional invitations of parties or some gatherings. This one, though, gives off a much personal vibe. Letters like this usually come from old students. People have grown fond of my parents. And they, in turn, treat like children of their own. I've only met a few of them. Most have moved on to become successful in their chosen careers, and little, little letters like this are their way of expressing gratitude. It's one thing Mom and Dad are, are proud of. Rightfully so. And I'm happy for them. But there are times. There are times I wish they'll remember they have a daughter here. The real one. It's not like they didn't raise me well and provide it for me. They did. And I wouldn't be where I am now if it weren't for their hard work. And like a dutiful child, I do everything I can to give back. Even it's a small thing as letting them know they've got another mail waiting for them. The phone rings for a good minute before someone answers. Mom. Her voice is warm as I remember. Becca? Hi, Mom. How's the conference going? Well enough. Until your da sprained his ankle. Oh no, is it bad? I'm alright. In case anyone in this family cares to listen, I'm alright. Very much- And there you have it. He'll be up and walking in a few weeks, don't worry. We're going to have to extend our stay here until it heals, though. Oh no, by all means, stay out there. This, this place is a death trap. Is something the matter? For me. Nothing big. Just that mail arrived for you. I got it last night, but... Things happened. A lie. Thankfully, she doesn't notice. Although, if I'm going to be honest, a small part of me yearns for her to do so in asking about it. But I put down that the idea almost as soon as it surfaces. I shouldn't make them fret. They're busy. Mm -hmm. What does it say? Raise your glasses, give cheers to the good times, blah blah. Becca Manners, that isn't how I taught you to read. <laughs> Sorry. You are cordially... Uh it's an invitation, Mum, for a housewarming party. From, uh, Hannah? Oh, no! A name rings a bell. For the moment, I can't recall when or where I've heard it recently. It must be nothing too important if I didn't bother committing it to memory. Great, now the entire family can join in on the fun. I'll just have the ghosts go down the entire list of that entire party goers. There are a lot of Hannahs in the world, so who knows? She also wrote you a note, Mum. It says you used to be her private tutor at the Evans Mansion. 
and that she misses you and would love would love to see you two again. Makes my heart clench to read never openly say those words to them. The same ones I want to tell them. I want to see you too. It's been years since we've been together as a family. And there's one thing that hasn't changed from a childhood. It's that mom and dad are still busy with their respective careers. Out of the country, I went in some meeting or symposium. Sometimes for months on end. I only grew more frequent over the years until I'm old enough to live on my own. I like to think that's how I've become independent at such an early age. They've always praised me for that. At times, I wish they didn't. Evans? Oh, I remember now. Honey, it's Hannah. Hannah Evans. Remember? Bright girl, two years older than Becca. Didn't she get married a few years ago? Seven now, I think. But nah, they grow up so fast, these kids. Yeah, she invited us to that too. Fonti de Medici. But we missed that one because you had to present your paper in Singapore. We did send her a note after. Still a shame we couldn't attend, though. Yeah, it's quite a shame we couldn't attend. What is it about this time? She sent another invite. For a housewarming party. Yes, we'll have games and things. Like, Luke's gonna throw some money at poor people and see how fast they run for the money. To where there's a pit at the end. But that's the fun part they don't know. Becca, when is it? This Friday, Mum. You know, and as a house whooping gift, the people who visit get to leave the gift rather than the other way around. Well, yes, you get one personal visit from a ghost girl. She may or may not kill you at the end, but hey, it's an experience. I guess we'd have to a decline one. again. I really miss that girl. Well, I imagine dodge a bullet. I could go in your place. Oh! I let it slip without thinking. Personally, I've never been fond of gatherings. Regardless of how simple people make it seem. But there's one thing I hate hearing. The disappointed note in Mom's voice always ranks first. Whether it's threatened me or some other thing doesn't matter. Are you sure? Don't you have work this Friday? The event will be in the evening, Mom. It shouldn't take anything away from my schedule. It's alright. The invites are two people. I can bring someone with me so things don't get boring. This is bring Ash. I see. Maybe you can also invite Ashton? Mom, that's a sure no from him. He hates attending parties. Damn, Rebecca, stop dodging around the bullet. But, but I'll see what I can do. If not, I can always bring... I can always bring Isabel with me, is what I'd say. I've gone into the habit of saying recently. Turns out I'm going to have to grow out of that sooner than expected. Hastily, I crack myself before they know anything and miss in my tone. I... I can always go alone. I'm a big girl now, I... I can handle these things. This isn't too much of a big deal. Okay, if it's not going to be a big problem for you, I don't see why not. We owe you this one, darling. No problem, Mum. I'll even say hi to Hana for you. Please do. And let her know we'd love to see her once we're back in the city. Leave her our number or something. But you know, the two of you would have become really good friends. Don't you remember? You met with her once. If my memory serves me right, you were 12 then? This too, I can't recall. It's probably one of those meetings where we only talked a bit before going our ways. She did leave an impression. I'm pretty sure I would have written about it somewhere, or at least recognized her name. As it is, the only people I remember clearly from that time in my life is Ashton. And Mandy. To some extent. Bum must have sensed my confusion because she laughs. Don't push yourself too hard, darling. Man, that Mandy. Real weird brother, though. I think his name was Bill or something. Really? It felt like having two daughters back then. Sometimes I wish they didn't send her away to boarding school. Uh, I think like, the full name was... You know how often that goes with them. The full name was... Bill Manley makes a reference to a cartoon. Still, it's a funny try name. talking to her while you're there. Oh, we'll see. I'll let you know what happens after. I'm looking forward to it, darling. Take care of yourself. Will do. You too, Mom. Bye. Uh, tell Dar to be careful next time. 
She chuckles, then. A hearty one. Tender always lying on my ears. She may be a stern teacher. This is the part of her I love the most. The sound of it still echoes even as our car call comes to an abrupt end, bringing with it a memory for so many years ago. When life or responsibilities like company adulthood are things far from our minds. If given the chance, I'd love to go, ba go back to those. I don't dwell on it, though. Shaking it all away almost as soon as the memory forms a clear picture in my head. I've always wondered how Isabella can easily pretend everything's normal over a phone call, then bounce back to her usual self immediately after. I've seen her do it plenty of times. For me, it just drains whatever energy I have. Soon, I'm leaning forward on the table, cushioning my head against my arms and closing my eyes. The last sound I hear is the news, the same headline from this morning. The authorities are still trying to find the cause of death for all the victims. Early investigation revealed most of them were employed under Briar Realty Corporation at the time of death. Meanwhile, BRC has refused to comment on this. Uh, we won't comment on the fact that our employees all seemingly died after entering this weird old haunted house. Our lawyer has advised us not to say anything. It's very secretive. We don't want to get sued. My lawyer told me this. Before I drift off to sleep, something reeks. A heavy, festering scent clinging to the air, wrapping itself around me like tendrils I'm unable to shake off. We're about to have a very rude awakening. Like fingers curling around my neck, twisting, winding. Like I almost tasted in my mouth. At my feet, war laps against my ankles. With every step, every ripple created, the stench only grows stronger. And I push on, pulled the verba by an indistinct voice in the distance. No, no, I'm not at the office! Oh, never mind, we're not safe! Not anywhere! The clutter that greets me inside is familiar. We had the new cup stacked on one end, yet to be disposed for some mundane reason. The pile of clothes to be pressed and folded. She'll get to it later, she promised. The files of paper strewn about the limited space she has. All because she needs to take her work home sometimes. You didn't see what's in her room. That's not something another human being would do. Come on, Rebecca. You have to believe me this time. It's stronger here. The smell. More suffocating. More invading. But there, at the far corner, she sits, bent over the mess lurking on the top of her work desk, nose almost touching the papers on it. I call out to her. Once. Twice. My voice only brimming with anger and frustration. You're still not going to believe me. Even if someone else already died, no? She does not respond. Something heavy lodges itself to my throat. The sound of my heartbeat crashes against my ears. With a trembling hand, I reach for her shoulder. And gently as I can, I turn her around. No. Yep. No, I'm sorry. Wake up, please. Wake up. <laughs> I wake up with a gasp. My heart hammering hard against my chest and my lungs fretting to a strain. Themselves in a sheer force of breathing. Stop. Stop thinking about it, Becca. It takes a while before reality once again sets in. For me to remember where I am. Here. There's none of that clutter. No one can bed she keeps forgetting to put in order. No papers littering every other surface my eyes can reach. No clothes left in a jumbled pile somewhere. No empty and distant newel cups that used to remind her to clean up every other day. Only tables carefully laid out for the customers. The soundless whir of the ceiling fans above. The murmurs of people dining in. And the strong fragrance of coffee and freshly baked pastries. <sighs> A sense of sharp relief overcomes me and a long-held breath escapes. This'll pass. This'll pass. What if the ghost is just staying there in the cafe? Just eyeing the pastries, ordering like a latte? Close by, I can sense the manager eyeing me with a concerned glance. Beside her, a night chef guy at the counter is doing the same thing, his eyes darting from the telly in their kitchen to me. I brush it all away with a wave of my hand and start gathering my things. I'm out the door into the busy Luxborn night streets before they can begin asking questions. Before yesterday's ghost can catch up to me. This case would be quite literal, and yet, I end up back here. It's quiet now. 
The more I stay on the opposite side of the street, only the forensics and the scene investigators are moving in out of the place. I wouldn't go back to your apartment if it's like right next to where someone's been murdered like that. I mean, let's say there's not a ghost. Let's say it's a, a serial killer or something. Like, Would you really want to go back to the same apartment right next door? There are a few onlookers, sure. But none of them dare come close to, like the last time. Some reporters are still asking the one on duty questions, jotting down notes from time to time, taking curious glances around. But otherwise, everything's peaceful in the area despite the hubbub this morning. If I squint, I can probably pretend things have gone back to normal after a day. However, until now, the memories are fresh. Even the smell of blood seems to linger in the air, holding on to it, clinging to it like a bitter reminder of what we lost in a single night. Crivance, the smell is yet to wash out from my hands. I've tried, burned through a whole bottle of soap at the inn, only for the scent to last more, no, no more than a few hours. Then, there's the images. That single instant when I touched her shoulders, the lifeless look in her eyes when her head lobbed backwards and her arms fell lifelessly to her sides. However, more than that, more than I care to confess, is the guilt, and it feels more real than the center of the memories. We fought that morning. Our rights shouted at each other. Would it have changed anything if we didn't? If I had treated her ideas real or not with less harshness, would anything have changed? Would she still be here? I guess I'll never know now. I'll I'll never sigh. I'll never reprieve from what's weighing down on me. Well, the many I've been allowing to slip out from my mouth lately. In a few days, they'll finally allow us back here to return to our lives. And for those who are left behind, to begin the process of mending. By then, will accepting be a little easier? I like to believe so. Suddenly exhausted, I begin to walk back to my temporary home, where I can pretend this all never happened before reality kicks in again. But short of crossing the street, a voice rings out, cutting for the fixed silence, stopping me in my tracks. What? Wait, Chief, no! Frey, listen first. You're in on this, aren't you? Watch your tone, Frey. This isn't up for discussion. Oh, hi. A closer look reveals three people staying near a police mobile. One of them is Ashton and LPT's chief inspector. The mobile blocks my view of the third person, but judging from the voice alone, it's Inspector Abigail. It appears to be some kind of regular police talk, but with the tone and how loud they're all speaking, it's close to brewing into a full-blown argument. Ashton, in particular, looks like he wants to punch something. Or someone. I was assigned here, Chief. And might I remind you again, I can very well reassign you someplace else if you don't listen. Much less keep yourself in check. I heard you the first time. I just... I just don't see why there's a need for this. I'm doing my job, aren't I? Course you don't see it. Should I give you a quick briefing? You snapped at a grand total of five people today. Five. Record-breaking, really, when it was at zero before. That doesn't count the ones from the forensics company, by the way. No one's asking, Abigail. Have you taken a look at yourself since this morning? I think Officer Carl might be a little afraid of you now, in fact. First time you lashed out on him like that. Actually, that was the first time we ever heard you lash out at anyone, and I must admit that was quite a show while it lasted. I did not lash out at Officer Carl. Or anyone. Stop exaggerating things. Oh, do you want to bet on that? Because I'm in serious need of cash right now. Christ, Abigail, I already told you it was just... Or is it because of the victim? I heard you were friends with her, but this is getting a bit out of hand for a friend, don't you think? Is there something you're not telling us? He falters into silence. A pain expression falls across his face as his hands clutch into fists. It doesn't last. In that short second, I caught a glimpse of him of he's been thinking what has been going through his mind the entire time. Just like the night before and that last glimpse of him his back turned against me. But to see up close, so openly displayed in front of other people is an entirely different thing. He's never wanted to let his walls down like that. Now, it's falling apart piece by piece without his meaning to. It's, that's... that's... that's none of your business! Oh no, no, it is my business, alright? I'm the one running this investigation, and you know how I do everything! This one most certainly does not have a place for young detectives with a bloody temper. You better stand down, hotshot, or I'm kicking you out with or without Chief here. My crime scene, my rules. Then you have to turn on your badge and pistol, too. 
You're a menace, Ash. I don't have a fucking bloody temper! Will you give it a rest already? Enough! Frey, get out of here. Take a chill pill. I don't need someone reckless running around this crime scene right now. Chief, you can't be serious. I am, I can, and I just did. Go on, out, out of this place, out of my sight! I'm in the middle of... Pass it to Abigail. All of it. She'll handle this for now until... Until... I don't know. Till your head's back in its proper place? No, you can't just... Frey, this is an order. Take a bloody chill pill. Or go get some coffee, ice cream, whatever it is you like to eat. I don't care as long as you clear your head. Come back when you've stopped looking like you want to dismember the person next to you. Is that clear? Chief, I... please. Not this case. I... I asked. Did I make myself clear, Detective Inspector? I never pause. It's been far heavier than the previous. There's a weight of his complete, re complete resignation on the matter. He doesn't look them in the eye when he answers. Nor does his tone carry any of his frustrations. But his wall is back. Loud and clear. I did not hear you. Loud and clear, sir. Good kid. Off you go. I don't want to see your pretty mug here in the next few hours. You're dismissed. Yes, sir. Except this time, it's been rebuilt in the wrong place. At the wrong time. For an entirely different reason. Knowing him, when it's like this, it will not hold long. Don't worry about missing out on anything. I'll keep you updated once you return, alright? Take a break for now. You haven't slept since last night. Thanks. They leave at him after with a pat on the back and nothing else. Branching tree. Yeah, we're still on that one major split. It's a very long route. But anger and frustration together are cold, ugly things to carry, much less to swallow. For someone like Ashton, coming with it is a whole different uphill climb. His is not the kind of f that fades away with time nor easily forgotten. It's a sort that he keeps close, allows to fester and drive him. But when that doesn't work, when all that keeps his mind occupied is taken from him, he's nothing but lost. That anger, too, loses its direction. So he fumes. Socks off to some place where he can be alone, where he can find something to vent it out on, where people won't see more of him beyond what he chooses to show. If that doesn't work either, he'll go back to the first step and do everything again. All into everything becomes a vicious cycle and eats him whole, chases him entirely as a person. He hates it when people meddle. He hates it more when people see him like this. But this is something he has to carry alone. This too is ours to bear. I won't let him suffer this alone. With that in mind, I follow after him. Minutes later, I finally track Ashton down at a nearby park. He can't sit still, pacing back and forth, running a hand through his hair in gesture of frustration every other pass he makes. At some point, he decides to take it on a poor park bench. Damn park bench! Only for his foot to get it all afterwards. He returns to pacing then. It's been out for at least five minutes. At this point, he might end up digging a trench in the ground if he doesn't let up. Someone should stop him. And I followed him here. I've intended to put an end to this, and a whole speech prepared for him. But now that I'm standing in close proximity to his temper, to him, I can't bring myself to even approach. My feet simply won't move the instant I saw him. Before long, my own resolve begins to to wane, gradually fading away underneath the uncertainties. What will he think? Will he appreciate this? He hates it when people interfere with his affairs, and here I am barging in on his business as with something I'm told to share. I think we've been stalking him here too. When I start faking this way, when I start faking this is okay. Why did I think this would be a good idea? I'm stepping back before I know it. Although, I don't make it far. In my rush, I actually step on a stray wrapper that's in a midst the trash. It crutches are my foot, and in the stillness of the park at this time, it's loud enough to disturb. Ashton halts, looks up, his vexed expression making way for his bewilderment. Becca? You aren't supposed to be here. It isn't meant to be an accusation, or be taken like one. It's a simple statement. It just sounds far from it all the same. A question underneath. Facing it now, I hesitate. Let's see. Ash right at the bar? I heard you know. Let's be straight. Nope. Can't 
can't sleep. Wow, you have to dodge a little bit. For all my bravado, for all the things I keep telling myself, I don't want to answer the unspoken question in it. Nor faces anger and sorrow what I, or what I will see beyond it. We may be in the same boat, but we have our own ways of dealing with this. Of living through this until we got that sense of normalcy back. But I also know I can't leave them out with these ghosts, quite literally. So I talk. I would get him to fill the awkward silence, but so long as it takes him, us, away from falling into that chasm, this will do. Sorry, I didn't mean to disturb you. Don't you usually avoid these parts at night? I... I just couldn't sleep tonight, so I decided to take a walk. Behind you. From a safe distance where you couldn't see me. For the last hour. I didn't think I'd find you here. Considering... Considering what happened last night. I thought... I thought you'd be busy. Not a complete lie. But when all he gives me for response is a stare, almost close to a blank look, I think for a second he found out. Eventually, he simply nods and exhales. Bad dream? Uh, yeah, kind of. I thought as much. I frown at him, confused at his blasé reply. Until I remember, he's always seen more dead bodies in his life compared to what my eyes have seen. It comes in his line of work. Bloody hell, he has a forensic science degree under his belt. At some point, he most likely worked on a cadaver before he even got out of the university. He also has a chain under that belt, too. He's also been assigned to cases like this before. When his close family, his relatives, friends go through this. None of it is surprising to him. And what if it is of a friend's, or someone he knows and has been close to for years? Won't it change anything? Does it ever get easy? Depends on who you're asking. Uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure this isn't the first time you've seen something like that. Like... Uh, like... I trail off, unable to continue. Careful of this talk going to territory that will create bigger wounds. Ashton, on the other hand, takes a long man to answer. Like he's weighing his next words, choosing it deliberately. Then he stuffs his hand inside his pockets and looks away at some far-off point beside him. Looking intently as though he's seen something there that I couldn't. His answer comes in the form of a shrug. And that voice almost too quiet. Too somber. You get used to it. Eventually. I suppose. There isn't any other way around this, huh? No, there isn't. Unfortunately. But you'll stop caring after the second or third time. The next thing you know. The next thing you know. All of them just looks the same as the others in your eyes. All unfortunate victims. Perhaps it is his tone, or his manner of avoiding my eyes when he says that. But before I can think on it, choose my words the same careful way he did earlier. I let my emotions get ahead of me. Hold on. Wait. Is that... Is that what this is, then? What she is now? To you? Just... Just a victim? Just some dead body? He answers more silence, and my temper, despite myself, flares. The victim has a name, Ash! And that victim is your friend! Why is it so difficult to say her name now when you've done it plenty of times before? Does it matter now? She's gone. Even Zack made a bigger issue out of that. There are other things you two should really be- It does matter! To you, it does! For a long time! You've always- you've always- You've always seen her in a different light. Far different from the way he'd look at other people, Zachary or me. Always with the tiny gleam in his eyes, the darting glances, and the kind smiles. Little things. Little gestures. To others, it may seem nothing. But to him, it means the whole world. Because it's the only way he can say everything without fumbling or losing his nerves. Right from the very start, and I don't need to ask the why. I've always had an inkling. The thought has always been there, hiding, tucked and neatly seated away at the back of my mind, in the same manner he keeps his own secrets close to himself. Which is why, when he swallows hard, allows his arm to fall onto his sides and shifts his gaze away, there's no jolt, no surprise in me. Just a slow, painful, burning realization of a truth long held, of feelings never meant to be for me. And yet, in the end... Like I said, it doesn't matter. You guys need to understand that whatever I say or do right now, this case isn't going to solve itself. In the end, it's him who cowers from it. You keep on saying case this, case that. 
But this isn't just about the bloody investigation anymore, is it? Well, you seem to have a better idea what it is. Why don't you lay it all out to me, so I'll understand. Maybe I'm missing something. Because honestly, I don't know what else this could be, other than what we've been telling the press. A fucking homicide case. The victim was murdered. And if you bring up that stupid letter again... Will you quit saying that? Well, what do you want me to say then? Stop lying to yourself! I'm lying? Becca, look here, I... No! Enough! Enough with your cool act! I'm having none of it! You listen, and you listen good! Stop this! Stop lying! Stop telling yourself everything and this is normal for you! Because it's not! It never was! It never will be! Rebecca, I think you need to calm down. Stop pretending Isabella no longer equates into all of this just because she's gone! Because that is a big, fat lie coming from you! She matters because it's her! She always did! No one else! Or you! She always did. The very meaning behind it freezes him into place. And any excuses or versions dies on his tongue. There's more to it, however. Beyond his unmoving stance, a sudden unfocused stare. There's understanding and fear. He's aware I'm right. Every word I'm about to articulate are the very same ones he's been avoiding. But he's need to be sad. Even means having him face the unpleasant. Regardless of what you're telling me, or Zachary, I know that out of all of us, you're the one taking this the hardest. I allow my voice to fade into the night, into the chilly air blowing in the distance between us. Cold, sharp, forgiving, much like the truths we have to face. Ashton is silent for quite some time, but the early shock in his face has given way to something flaccid, subdued. And when that silence becomes too unbearable for him as well, he forces himself to move, to pace, treading the ground once again, one perturbed footstep after another running a furious head to his hair before dropping to his side. Hand? You mean a hand? Later, when that too turns inadequate, he gives a park bench another good kick. This time, if it brings any pain to him, he simply takes it all in, as if that alone will dull the ever pain. <sighs> Fuck. Regardless, he continues. But this time, there's something in his voice. A bare note dropping to nothing more than whispers he admires to himself. A sound he meant only for his ears to hear, but reverberates clearly in the park's stillness. Ash, maybe you should... Damn it. Damn it. God damn it. I was hoping... Damn it. I was hoping for... To... For her to... His throat closes up. His words choke off, getting lost in his sorrow. And then will continue. He passes his hand over his eyes instead, letting out a slow, ragged breath that brings him neither a sense of comfort nor relief. And simply never reminded of what he failed to do. She's. I couldn't even. Damn it, all these years. Keep telling myself she's. That I love. And yet I couldn't even. She... This is when he breaks. Piece by piece. Brick by brick. The walls he has struggled to pull up all what came tumbling down. All of his defenses caving in, weakening as it bears the brunt of his grief. A words are halting when that first tear begins to fall, his shoulders shaking, hands clenched tightly, his wrists holding on to something quickly slipping away from him. Or maybe he already did. Maybe this comes from all those missed opportunities. Her departure took it all with her, and what he's clinging to right now are merely the fragments. Remnants of all what's ifs and should haves. I... I knew this was going to be a difficult case. The moment I saw it, I knew there was barely any evidence. Not even a sign of someone else breaking in. And, and she's just there. I've been at this since last night, and I couldn't find anything that would help. I hate this. I hate feeling this stupid, this, this helpless. I can't even begin to imagine what she felt before she... Before she... Figures, huh? Turns out... I'll mess this up, too, huh? In truth, I do not know how to answer that. Or if he's expecting any from me. He's just ranting. It's one of those questions where there's really no exact answer to, 
Some of those little regrets now surfacing, lingering. And every day, I tell him exactly how I see without havering. Wavering? That, no matter how, there's no way we could have prepared for this. No way we could have known things would lead to this. But those are pains bare left for another day. When we're hurting less, we aren't reeling for what has already been haphazardly thrown at us. After all, platitudes tend to seize their usefulness at some point. And in its place, I have nothing else to offer but a shoulder to cry on. With an awkward fit like this, with his trembling shoulders and short, heaving breaths. Though he allows it, he doesn't return the gesture, nor do I expect him to do so. Unlike Isabella, who was always open to free of her fondness for people, personal space has always been a matter of importance for the two of us. Ashton, most of all. For the time being, this'll do. Vanport, you're an idiot. Of course I know how you're feeling about this. Who do you think I am? We grew up together, didn't we? I know you better than anyone. Stop forgetting stuff like that. Drill it into your head, if you must. We'll take what little comfort we can gain from this, beyond what reinsurance's mere words can offer. In this short moment we share, this is enough. We exchanged no words after, simply staying there for a good half of hour, letting the late night din of the city, the rustling of leaves, and the hum of crickets nearby fill the air around us. We remain like this until the sobs finally subside and what's left of it are nothing more than soft whimpers. When last he pulls away from me, it's as the heavy atmosphere is finally lifted around us and what he carries with him no longer burrs him the way he did minutes ago. Not completely, though. Even with this, it will take longer for everything to fade, and neither will be easily forgotten. Especially when it has taken root so deeply in our lives. Too bad we're all gonna be dead in about a few days. He's calm now, thanks to manly badass hero and his life choices. For, for us, well, them. My mind's kind of jumping between two different worlds here. It's better this way. Because the only in the aftermath is when we'll learn to deal. To cope. Is it going to be okay now? That's the start. I can't always walk him through this. He knows that too. So when he answers, he has nothing more of me and only answers to the best manner he can. Without reverting back to anger or lock himself away. I... Yeah. A little, I guess. I don't know. This is... This is... <sighs> It'll take some time. There's still the investigation and the evidence, if we can even find any. Plus, the lab still has to test everything. Ash, I'm not asking about the case. Although that's important, trust me, I want to know who did this as much as you do. At least then, I'll have a proper reason to hit someone. But I'm asking about you. Are you going to be okay? And of a mirthless expression flickers shortly across his feature before he looks away, his eyes focusing on some distant area of the park. There's a hint of a yearning in them, probably searching for that one person who could never be here from now on. It's gone, and he's already talking the next day before I can prompt him. I'll be... I'll be fine. A bit of adjustment here and there, maybe. I'll be okay. I've... I've survived worse things. I doubt he believes those, but I don't question him further on, and neither does he let me. But thanks for asking. And... for this. Sorry you had to see me like that. What? Don't be so embarrassed about it now. This isn't the first time, remember? Back in secondary? If I recall, someone had to snap you out of that sulk, too. Uh, yeah. No. No. Don't remind me. And don't sound so proud of it. <laughs> Why not? I mean, you've done more embarrassing things in front of other people, and I always have to... That's the point. It's embarrassing. Oh, come on. Now you're feeling ashamed about it? For the record, there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, I'm aware of that. But let's just leave it there, Becca. And... and if you can, if possible, can you... can you not... don't... just... Don't mention this to Zack. For now. I'll never hear the end of it. There's a lot of things he intentionally leaves out in that. So many things he refuses to tell. And it's all being hidden under that false front. His head's notes alone. The shift of his tone from that banter speaks volumes. Zachary's never been one to easily judge people. It's part of the reason why Ashton hangs out with him despite the rather disastrous first meeting. 
big guy learning about his little episode won't make a difference nor even change things around them. It's just one of the many things they learn to accept. Or in some cases, tolerate about each other. Of course, other mean things like punching us in this morning ever occurs. That doesn't mean it can't easily be fixed, so... Sometimes, all I need is a little push. Kids. Zachary will understand. Yeah, I... I know. I know that. But I'd... I'd rather... talk to him in person first. About other things. And when we're in better terms, maybe we can laugh about this, but right now... Oh, Zachary. Well, he's not dead yet, but still. I won't mention anything. Don't worry. Though, like I said, Zachary will understand. You are just doing your job, and... And that kind of news isn't easy to swallow. Anyone would have reacted that way, even if it's someone like Zack. In fact, if I didn't know the big guy, he's probably feeling guilty about it like you're doing now. Trust me, it'll be okay. He merely smiles in reply. Straining a bit awkward, but I take it for everything it stands for right now. Today and the next, a little drop of optimism could do us some good. Even if things appear a wee bit bleaker than it should be, or were people rarely inclined to hope blindly. The kind of predisposition has always been Isabella or Zack's department. Never from us who seeks the facts and what we've seen in front of us. But this time, taking a page from the book isn't so bad. What is there left to lose? We don't stay long. The evening might be pleasant and the park offers a peaceful enough place to booze on things, but we have work to do. Both of us. And though Ashton doesn't openly express it, I know he still wishes to be alone after this and mourn in his own way. The heaviest of his burden might have already been lifted, but there are parts he could use to hold close. Bits and pieces he'd more difficult to let go of. Those are the ones I can never reach. And in spite of the fact that the mere fob sends my heart clenching, I can't bring myself to begrudge him for it. In this way, we are the same. Some wounds simply take longer to heal. Which is why I don't stop him, and quietly we part ways. He goes straight off to Salem well again, only leaving a small promise to get to the bottom of this while I head back to the city proper. Where an unfamiliar room and more awful dreams probably wait for me. And perhaps it's exactly the fear of being left with these thoughts of my own that leads me back to the cafe instead. Delaying the inevitable, they say. Just don't think about these as long as I'm awake, moving in the company of other people. 